Please remain standing and take a Bible and turn to the sixth chapter of Luke. And if you didn't bring one with you today, there are many scattered around the room. You should be able to find one. And we'll be looking at verses 43 through the end of the chapter of chapter 6. And if you're looking at one of our Bibles here in this room, it's on page 863. And I'll read those verses if you would follow along. These are the words of Jesus. For no good tree bears bad fruit, nor again does a bad tree bear good fruit. For each tree is known by its own fruit. For figs are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor are grapes picked from a bramble bush. The good person, out of the good treasure of his heart, produces good. And the evil person, out of his evil treasure, produces evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I tell you? Everyone who comes to me and hears my word and does them, I, I will show you what he is like. He's like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And when a flood arose, the stream broke against the house and could not shake it because it had been well built. But the one who hears and does not do them is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. When the stream broke against it, immediately it fell. And the ruin of that house was great. This is the word of the Lord. Please be seated. God, we come to you this morning, and as we've just been singing in this ancient song, we are helpless and hopeless without you. We need you for everything in life. We are dependent on you. We are especially dependent on you this morning as we come to your word. We come to your word from all sorts of situations in life. Sometimes we come to these times of public worship and we've had a week in which we've had horrible things happen and we're angry. Uh, sometimes we come because we're uh, forced to do so by the opinions of people around us. But God, whatever the case is this morning, I pray that each one of us, by the power of your Holy Spirit, could see your truth and apply it to our lives correctly. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We have been looking at the Sermon on the Mount from the sixth chapter of Luke for a couple of weeks now. And we have seen that Jesus said that our Father is full of mercy, and as His children, we should be full of mercy as well. And I'm just wondering this morning what kind of a, of a mood you're in, and I wanted to throw a few pictures up on the screen. Um, as you look at pictures like this of floods that damage neighborhoods, uh, or as you look at the damage that a, a tornado can do, or as you look at a dead tree that is no longer bearing any fruit, doesn't have any leaves on it at all, uh, what impulse rises up inside of you? Is there an impulse of, of God's mercy? Is there an impulse that says, I, I, I see the pain of this? Trees that are dead, houses that are destroyed, represent people that are destroyed. And as we look at this chapter, God is full of mercy. Our Heavenly Father is full of mercy. As His children, are we full of mercy? If we don't have mercy welling up in us about these situations, maybe we've never experienced God's mercy we're coming to the conclusion of this section of Luke, and the Sermon on the Mount in the book of Matthew takes up almost three full chapters. 
Luke has a much shorter account of this teaching by Jesus. Um, we don't know if this is the same episode in the life of Jesus and Luke is just shortening it up or if Jesus presented this material at several different times throughout his life. But these are the words that Luke wanted us to know. This is the teaching of Jesus that Luke wanted us to have. Luke has recorded these words for purposes and the first thing that we see in verse 43 is this talk about trees and fruit. God wants us to understand His truth, and so He oftentimes makes comparisons. And most of us see wildlife, we see trees, and we as Christians and we as human beings are often compared to trees. And obviously there are principles that produce a healthy, growing, fruit-producing tree, and there are things that also produce that in a human life. And so back in Psalm Chapter 1, uh, the psalmist talked about the tree that was planted next to streams that had roots that went down deep, whose leaves did not wither, uh, but the evil people who were not walking with God were like chaff that were easily blown away. Uh, the Jews who were here listening to Jesus wouldn't find it strange that Jesus would talk this way because they had been raised on the Psalms and so they had heard this before. And so being compared to a tree wasn't a big deal for them. And they knew the obvious. Uh, peach trees are supposed to have peaches. Apple trees are supposed to have apples. If you have a big weed in your backyard, most likely it's not going to produce blueberries. And so we, we know these things. They are instinctive to us. And so Jesus says, the good person out of the good treasure of his heart produces good, and the evil person out of his evil treasure produces evil. Uh, out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. The heart, the, the inside part of us, drives us. What comes out of us, our, our words, our actions, come from deep within us. And as a tree that is supposed to bear fruit, uh, we, as we walk with God, because He is deep inside of us, the things that are produced are the things of God. These truths that Jesus is talking to us about this morning are probably nothing new to most of you here. You've probably heard it. And again, it's easy to understand. Healthy trees, healthy people. Healthy trees, healthy Christians. But what if an evil person, someone who knows that they aren't producing good fruit, wants to change? In fact, what if you read these verses this morning and you look at your life and you say, you know, I, I realize that the fruit that God wants to produce in my life is not coming out. How do human beings change? I have been around a lot of people who have actually looked at that question and they've said something rather negative. I've heard experts firsthand say, human beings can't change. There really is no such thing as change in a human life. Once a thief, always a thief. Once an evil person, always an evil person. How do human beings change? Is it even possible for human beings to change. Once addicted to pornography, always addicted to pornography. I'd like to admit something to you this morning. I'd like to admit to you that I have failed you as a pastor. I've had really good intentions for most of my life, but I have failed you as a pastor. And here is the way that I have failed you. 
I believe in education. I believe in Christ-centered education. And so because I believe in education and because I believe that education produces change, I have encouraged you to be educated in the Bible. I've encouraged you to read the Bible. We have, uh, at times, we have encouraged you to read through the Bible in one year, and many of you have done that. I've encouraged you to attend Bible studies, to attend seminars, to attend any kind of teaching that you can get from the Word of God. Teach people, and change happens. But something's happened to us. And it hasn't just happened over the last couple of years. It's been happening for a long time. And it's not good. In fact, C.S. Lewis, back in the 1940s, identified this change that has begun to occur in our lives. He wrote an incredible book called The Screwtape Letters. How many of you ever heard of it? Interesting book in that screw tape is basically Satan and his little intern is a guy named Wormwood. And basically it's a book that's written to show us as Christians the techniques that Satan uses to attack us. It's kind of like getting into the enemy's camp and reading and obviously it's fictional. But here's a little passage that was written back in the 1940s. Screw tape writing to Wormwood writes that might have been that might have been so if he had lived a few centuries earlier. At that time, the humans still knew pretty well when a thing was proved and when it was not. And if it was proved, they really believed it. They still connected thinking with doing and were prepared to alter their way of life as a result of a chain of reasoning. Back in the 1940s, C.S. Lewis was able to look back and say, hey, back in the day, people connected thinking with doing and were prepared to alter their way of life as a result of a chain of reasoning. I'm afraid that in these modern times, we've moved away from thinking and doing, and we just think. And we've put a lot of knowledge into our heads, and we're quite proud of the things that we learn and quite proud of the things that we know. But doing is not connected with education. We find it quite rewarding to hear and to learn and to let others know how much we know. Uh, it's interesting. There's a new book that's going to come out very soon called The Death of Expertise by Tom Nichols. And this is typical of the day in which we live. Uh, a true-to-life incident that occurred just a few months back. Nichols relays an incident where someone on Twitter was trying to do research about sarin gas. You might have heard about sarin gas. When the world's expert on sarin gas offered to help the original tweeter, who we could call a twit, <laughs> proceeded to angrily lecture the expert for acting like a know-it-all. The expert may not have known all, but in this case he knew exponentially more than that guy knew. And isn't that typical of our day? Hey, I'm doing some research on sarin gas. Hey, I'm the world's expert on sarin gas. Hey, quit being a know-it-all. We, we enjoy knowing, but we're really mixed up in our knowing and what to do with it. Here's a question for you to consider. With all of the knowledge that is available to us today, how much better are human beings in 2017 than they were in 1917, 1817, 1717? What good has our knowledge really produced? How do humans change? 
Well, believe it or not, Jesus is concerned about this, and he answers that question in Luke 6, verses 46 to 49. Jesus asks this incredible question in verse 46. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I tell you? Jesus was teacher. He was rabbi. People would call him rabbi, but he was also called Lord, Lord. You, you can understand that that makes this more personal. For Jesus to be a teacher, you could call him rabbi. To call him Lord, you were aware of who he was, what he could do. And here Jesus says, why do you call me Lord? Why do you put me on this position of honor and not do what I tell you to do. And when Jesus asks that question, he really shows us something incredible. Our problem is not what we know or what we don't know. Our problem is that we're disobedient. If we were to go back to the garden of Genesis 1 to 3, what would we do differently to prevent Adam and Eve from falling into sin? Could we have had a seminar for them and said, Adam and Eve, you just need to really know the truth here. We're going to teach you more. Was that the problem? <laughs> no. Adam and Eve's problem was they were disobedient. We are disobedient, and that's our problem. In verse 47, Jesus says, Everyone who comes to me and hears my words and does them, I'll show you what he's like. I like to call these verses Calvary Church verses, because anybody who's been at Calvary for more than four years has heard a little bit about the importance of the foundation of a building, right? <laughs> He's like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And when the flood arose, the stream broke against that house and could not shake it because it had been built well. Like a tree planted next to streams of water in Psalm 1, this house built on a rock doesn't fall. When floods hit it. Now, when I hear, have heard Christians talk about these verses, I've, I've heard them say something like this. You need to build your life on Jesus Christ, the rock. Give me the rock. Give me Jesus. That's the important thing of these verses. In fact, one of the first songs I can ever remember learning when I was a, a little kid was about a wise man building his house on the rock, and the last verse of that song is, so build your life on the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, those words are really good, and those words are a good start. But how do you build your life on Jesus Christ? What does that even mean? Notice the words of Jesus in verse 47. Everyone who comes to me and hears my word and does them. Do you see the actions that Jesus talks about in these verses? The, the house that's built on a rock that doesn't fall, doesn't fail. The house whose foundation really stands is built by people who have come to Jesus, who call him Lord, Lord. It's built by people who hear. They hear the words of Jesus. It's one thing to, to come to Jesus. Hey, let's hang out with Jesus. This is cool. Jesus is talking. I don't care. Jesus is talking. I'm just here. I'm just hanging out. But the person who builds his life on Jesus comes to Jesus and hears the words of Jesus and does them. 
Do you see that connection? Coming to Jesus, hearing Jesus, and doing. Brothers and sisters, for the last many, many decades, we have stopped with the first two actions. We come to Jesus, we hear, but doing. That's, that's a different thing. We miss that connection. We enjoy learning. We enjoy knowing, but doing. That's not as fun. That doesn't mean as much to us. And then the tragedy. But the one who hears and does not do them is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. When the stream broke against it, immediately it fell, and the ruin of that house was great. This whole section of Luke started back in verse 20. And he lifted up his eyes on his disciples, and he said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. And this section ends with these haunting words, The ruin of that house was great. Jesus began speaking to his disciples talking to them about how they were blessed. And the last phrase of his sermon, he talked about the great ruin of those who do not come to Jesus, hear Jesus, and do what Jesus says. If you drive around this north area of Denver where most of us live, you can drive block after block after block, and you can see some beautiful houses. And with all the moisture we've gotten lately, uh, in the next week, these houses are just going to be beautiful, aren't they? The front yards are going to be green. There are going to be flowers starting to bud. The leaves are starting to come in on trees. We live in a beautiful part of the country. And it's been a while, but you, you don't usually hear about houses in our area spontaneously falling down. I mean, some of you might say, yeah, my house wasn't built right. The contractor didn't put this in right or something. But very few houses just fall down anymore. Usually they're built reasonably well so that they don't fall. But these beautiful houses are not representative of the lives of the people who live in them, are they? If you compare the lives of people to houses in our area. You could drive block after block after block and say, ruin, 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 ruin. People's lives are a mess. And we, unfortunately, can be a part of the problem. We, unfortunately, may not even be equipped to help anybody who might live in a beautiful house, but whose life is an absolutely mess, whose, whose life has been just destroyed by floods that have come on them. Not true floods, but floods of life's circumstances. Several years ago, I was at a church that was hosting a, a Bible study. And at the conclusion of the Bible study, some representatives from the Bible study came in to meet with me. And they were mad. They were mad that the room hadn't been prepared properly for them, that the temperature wasn't adjusted properly, materials for the study hadn't come in on time. It was some of the most grumbling that I've ever heard as a pastor. And I was a young pastor at this time, and so I, after they left, I decided, well, I'm, I'm going to talk to them a little bit. I'm going to look up passages on grumbling. <laughs> and so the one that came up on my laptop first was Philippians 2.14. Do all things without grumbling or disputing. Guess what book of the Bible this group of people have been studying? <laughs> no lie, true, true story, true story. Here, they study Philippians for several months, and 
at the end of it, it's like they just it didn't register. Now, they could have prou proudly crossed that off their bucket list. Boom! Study Philippians. All done, Jesus, ready to go. But they forgot to remember what Philippians said. They forgot to do Philippians. Our problem is not what we know or what we don't know. Our problem is that we're disobedient. It's interesting to see what Matthew says in this very similar account. Matthew writes this, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. How do human beings change? Obedience to God is how we change. Obedience to God. And here is something even more interesting. According to Matthew, in this very same message, how do humans know God? We know God by obedience. I want to challenge you, every one of you, in some way, shape, or form, is a part of a family. Some of you here are parents in the thick of parenting. Some of you have those uh, experiences in the rearview mirror. Some of you are anticipating those experiences. We've all had experiences in a family. Parents, I would say to you, when do your kids really get to know you? when you are punishing them, when you're disciplining them? Now, I don't think any of us as parents would like to say, I want my child to know just what a thick, tough person I am. We get to know our kids and they get to know us through obedience, right? That's when true knowledge is shared. Humans change by obeying God, and we actually get to know God by obeying Him. Well, there are some changes that I'd like to challenge you with from Luke 647. Call them 647 changes. And the first change is reading. Read the Bible as coming to Jesus, hearing His words, and doing. Instead of reading the Bible as if you're going to take a test on it, read the Bible and say, what does this mean I should do? Listening. When you listen to podcasts, messages like this, come to Jesus, listen to Jesus. What is Jesus talking to you about doing what changes are there that he would encourage you to take on today? And doing. Do it. Our problem is not what we know or what we don't know. Our problem is that we're disobedient. And Jesus points this out, and living in our time in history, this is a unique challenge for us. It's always been a challenge for God's people to obey. We can look back and see the people of Israel throughout the Old Testament. But for us today, we are told that the amount of knowledge that is available to us is doubling every two and a half years or something like that. We're very proud of that. But what are we doing with that knowledge? Brothers and sisters, today, may we come to Jesus. And if you've never come to Jesus, come to Jesus today. We are separated from God by our sin. And Jesus bridges 
the gap between us and God. If you've never come to Jesus, come today. I would love to talk to you about that. Don't leave today without talking to me about that. If you have any questions, come to Jesus. Listen to Jesus. And do what he says. It isn't rocket science. But it's so important. And it's what we are here to do. Even here at Calvary Church on Sunday mornings, when we come together in this gathering, are there ways in which we could encourage each other after we've come to Jesus, after we've listened to Him, to do what He says? Would you think about that? Would you pray about that for the glory of God today? Heavenly Father, we praise You. We bless You for Jesus Christ. We thank You for these words of His and God, we have built our lives on many things other than Jesus. We've built them on the hope of finances. We've built them on the hope of relationships. We've built them on the hope of a job. But God, this morning, we come to you and say, give us Jesus. Give us the rock. We want Jesus only. In fact, in just a second, we're going to proclaim something to you, Jesus. And help us to sing this seriously if we really mean it. Can we sing today honestly? I'd rather have Jesus than anything. I'd rather have Jesus than anything. Help us to sing these words, Jesus, from our hearts. And then as we go out into this world of broken homes, broken down houses all over the place, may we help people to see how real change is possible through obedience. We love you, Jesus, and we pray in your name. Amen.